Okay, so hello, uh, my name is Abby McSherry and I'm the Communications and Outreach Officer for the CAM project. So I'd like to welcome you all to this um, Zoom webinar and most of all I'd like to welcome Mark McCrory, our speaker this morning. Mark is the lead on Borden Mona's ecology team and will be giving us an inside view of the environmental constraints of rehabilitation versus restoration in the context of Borden Mona's cutaway bogs, examining the progress made and talking through the highs and lows of previous rehab projects and looking at new techniques being applied. As I mentioned, this webinar is part of the CAN project, which is supported by the European Union's Interreg VA program, managed by the special EU programs body. So just a little housekeeping, at least on Zoom, I don't have to talk to you about emergency <coughs> exits and toilets, um, but we would be grateful if you could all mute your microphones while Mark is speaking. We will have an opportunity for questions at the end. If you have any questions as the talk progresses, please feel free to write them in the chat function of your Zoom page. and We'll work through them getting answers when Mark finishes the main part of the session. We are planning to record this session. It says it's, plan it says it's recording, so we have everything crossed for the technology working. Um, and we will put that recording up on our YouTube channel. Um, and I will send the link um, for that to all the people who registered for this talk today. Um, we'll also be taking a couple of shots, um, screenshots during the um, talk. This is just to prove that it happened for our funders. But if you'd rather your face didn't appear, just turn off your video camera. Um, and with that, I shall pass over to Mark, who will share his screen and speak to us about this very, very interesting subject. Thank you very much. Thanks, Abby. So you might just confirm that uh, you can see that, okay? Great. Okay, well, sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it was great to see some names that I knew popping up. Uh, looks like we're fairly, um, you know, spread out. Uh, you know, we're not all, just all from um, Ireland or, or Northern Ireland. So that's that's good to see. Anyway, look. Uh, just by way of an introduction, I know Abby is. Uh, uh, yeah, that's good. I don't know, can, Abby, could you put everybody on mute? Is that an option for you? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Probably. I watched the football here, so it should be fine. Yeah. Is on. Right. Or if, if, if people are listening, they might, there, there's, a, there's so, somebody chatting away there. They might just go on mute if, they, if they're going to listen to me or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find out how to do that, but I'm not actually sure how to do that. Um, Hold on. <laughs> I did laugh. There was a thing in yesterday. Uh, yeah, I can't see how to do that. All that is yeah. not an option I have. The thing about what's the crack with these Zoom meetings because they don't really go by go as fast as the name implies. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Mm. Who's talking? What was your job in Ballinrobe? Uh, was that the one during the winter? Uh, this year, yeah, 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 yeah. And do you think we'll get that again this winter? Is that Brian? Yes. Brian, could you please turn off your microphone, please? I thought it was off. How are you doing, Brian? How's it going? Sorry, I thought it was off. You're off now. Anyway, okay, thanks very much. Um, so, look. Yeah, by way of an introduction, look, I've been working in Board Nimona for uh, going on uh, 11 years now, uh, working in the ecology team. I'm now ecology manager. Like our main role was uh, you know, planning peak and rehabilitation. Obviously, now uh, everything has changed for us. I'm sure this is what I'm, I'm going to talk about today. So, just a, by way of a short introduction to Board and Mona. Uh, sorry, some... sorry, Mark. Do you think we've got both slides visible at the moment? Do you think you could just share the, the current slide, not both slides?
Just bear with me. Okay, uh, is that just one slide coming through now? Great, okay. Okay, well, look, by way of a short introduction to some of you may not be familiar with Board Nimona. Obviously, Board Nimona uh, developed um, out of the Irish Turf Development Board. Uh, they were set up to utilize uh, uh, peatland resources in Ireland, you know, to utilize them, uh, to develop them for energy, for growing media, uh, for turf. Uh, we've had a long history. Obviously, you can see the you know the piles of turf uh, that were you know stacked. The, you know these were stacked up in the Phoenix Park, you know during the emergency, as uh, the Second World War uh, uh, was called. And uh, look, over the years, there's been uh, you know obviously a lot of a lot of in innovation, a lot of social history. You can obviously see the houses mm -hmm. that uh, Borden Mona built for some of the workers. So a huge impact on the Midlands of Ireland. I was going to say, this is the ecology team. Um, when I joined, uh, you know, 2009 now, we were, I think we were do, doing a bit of survey work there. Um, but just, just an idea of some of the conditions that um, these, these lads would have worked in uh, when they joined uh, Borden Mona. Obviously, it was all manual labour at that time. Um, but our peatlands are, are spread all over Ireland uh, and through the Midlands. They cover about 7% of the total area of Irish peatlands, mostly raised bog. Obviously, we have a, a, a few um, bits of land holdings in Kerry and Donegal and uh, you know, about 5,000 hectares up in County Mayo, which is Blanca bog. Uh, but I'm really going to be talking about uh, the Midlands and those raised bogs that you can see in, in yellow. So, you know, why, why are we uh, so excited now? Well, look, obviously, uh, Board of Mona announced at the start of last year that it was ending all um, peat harvesting. Mm -hmm. And sure, look, we, we have been planning for this for, you know, for a long time, but, you know, it, it almost came as a surprise. And uh, Board of Mona, they obviously would have been looking out to continue peat harvesting to 2027. But for a variety of reasons, including you know legal issues regarding uh, you know consenting of industrial peat extraction, uh, commercial issues, uh, uh, again, uh, and then issues in relation to just the um, the cost of actually continuing to harvest uh, during during that kind of period into the future versus the you know the fact that you know the the PSO in relation to um, the turf cutting support, you know, in the Republic of Ireland had gone at the end of 2020. It just made, increasingly, all these things made industrial peat extraction more and more unviable for Borden and Mona. So the, the company was well aware as well of, of all the issues in relation to environmental issues in terms of carbon and so on. And they knew peat extraction was coming to an end. So they, they made that decision to pull that kind of end date to um, 2020. And this led into the development of the Peatland um, Climate Action Scheme. So what is the Peatland Climate Action Scheme? Well, look, you know, I've been talking about um, rehabilitation um, for a long time now, and we know we have to rehabilitate our, our bogs on board in Mona. Obviously, we have IPC licenses that um, govern uh, peat extraction, and, and they require uh, permanent rehabilitation. Um, so we were obliged to carry out this rehabilitation, but um, the Peatland Climate Action Scheme wants, wants to go further in relation to what was required, you know, in relation to our previous um, commitments. So, you know, can we do more in relation to uh, what we do with our bogs now? Just some high level details. Um, this is a 25 million euro investment. It's, it's mostly supported by government uh, and, you know, uh, to the tune of 109 million with the the difference uh, funded by Borden and Mona. Uh, this is very important for Borden and Mona in terms of this change uh, from peat extraction, you know, two years ago to now no peat extraction. And, and obviously this is important for um, jobs and, and the just transition. And, you know, potentially supporting, you know, around 350 jobs. Obviously the, the scheme has been set up to really try to optimize climate action benefits 
So re-wetting that peat, trying to keep that carbon in the ground. And then in the, in the longer term, you know, starting to develop um, peatland ecosystems that potentially down the road can start to sequester carbon again. And we know, uh, you know, this is going to deliver a lot of other ecosystem service benefits like biodiversity and, and water uh, improvements in terms of water quality and, and water attenuation and even just improvements on the landscape. Anyone that's um, driven down through the Midlands, you know, will we'll see these Bordemona bogs and, you know, when they're in peat extraction, like the picture shows, sure, they're just a, a kind of a landscape of, of bare peat, uh, you know, and, and now that landscape is going to change. So the real, the, the key objective here, you know, in relation to rehabilitation, it's all about trying to re-wet peat. And again, for us, it's optimizing the suitable hydro hydrology. And, and generally, that's, it's all about water levels. And it's, it's trying to put in the most appropriate water level back into uh, what we have left. Uh, so again, we look to re-wet the residual peat. That's obviously important for carbon storage in terms of the residual peat. Uh, and again, accelerating the trajectory of, of, of naturally functioning people and ecosystems. And uh, again, you know, again, when I say, you know, trying to manage these water levels, you know, in general, you know, it's, it's about either the water not being close enough to the peat surface or, you know, too much water, you know. So, so a lot of the work we're doing now is really trying to look at the hydrology and try and, trying to do what we did better. Obviously, we're still going to be blocking drains, but now we're you know, looking to see, can we modify the environment? Can we modify the topography and create this flatter topography to, to get better hydrological management? So like, like in a nutshell, this is what we want to do. We want to go from these bare peat fields to uh, a more stable, uh, re-wetted uh, peatland ecosystem. And uh, again, I talk about rehabilitation here. This picture here uh, is of Valley Con. Uh, it's this vegetation, it's dominated by bog cotton. So it's not going to be raised bog, okay? Uh, and that's because the majority of peat has been um, taken out of this bog. But what we can do is re-wet the residual peat and develop these other, uh, uh, um, ecosystems and and this is this is poor fan this will, this will be a, a fan wetland and again you know very important you know to understand where, where we have come from okay and just on that point like the starting point for all of this uh, all of these sites is raised bog you know and but again because Bordemont have taken out so much peat uh, taken out you know maybe six seven eight meters of peat uh, with some sites having very um, little residual peat, you can't just go back to raised bog. And, and that's why uh, we get fussy about, you know, talking about the difference between restoration, which would be res restoration back to raised bog, and rehabilitation, which is uh, developing other habitats. So again, just to kind of give you that indication of, of the timelines here and the, you know, the cont continuation of peat extraction, like in general, we're taking about um, 20 centimeters off the bog every year um, on average. And uh, like in general, we would say like a typical bog would have a 50 year um, lifespan. Uh, and then, you know, the majority of peat is taken out. Uh, but now we find that because we've um, um, stopped peat extraction at an earlier date than we originally in, uh, expected. We have bogs in lots of different types of conditions and some of our bogs still have relatively deep peat. And that's exciting to me as an ecologist because it means we might be able to do something different with those. So again, like very important to realize all of our bogs, you know, they're quite heterogeneous. So we have lots of different starting conditions and that means lots of different rehabilitation approaches. So to give you an idea of some of the habitats you will see on our cutaway bogs, and again, look, if you come down to Lockboard Discovery Park, like you'll see these uh, different habitats, but like we talk a lot about pioneer per fan and this vegetation, it can be characterized by, you know, lots of um, dominance of rushes or, you know, dominance of ball cotton. Uh, and again, you know, that just reflects the underlying environment. Uh, which is probably going from, uh, it's not acidic anymore, it's a little bit more alkaline, and that just, on, you know, reflects the underlying 
um, subsoil geology. And the fact that, you know, the residual peat now is fed peat. Um, where it's dry, we would get birch scrub. And, you know, in, in some places, all the peat has been extracted and the, the glacial subsoil has been exposed. And these could be ridges or mounds. I'm sure they're, you know, they're going to develop um, woodland in time again. We tend not to get a whole pile of, of heather colonizing, only in particular areas. And again, it tends to like a little bit more acidity and would be like an indicator of, of slightly more acidic conditions. Uh, and again, but the heather is also, you know, an indicator of drier conditions. And obviously, you know, a lot of our bogs are, are pump bogs. Uh, they're below the level of the Shannon or the adjacent um, river catchments. And we know that like, if we turn those pumps off, like in general, water levels are going to rise and we'll see this kind of mosaic of, of wetlands and open water uh, uh, development again. And if you go walking on, on any of our bogs, like you'll, you know, you'll come across these patches of calcareous grassland. And, you know, the picture doesn't really reflect the diversity of, of this habitat, particularly in the summertime when the orchids are out. And it can be really fantastic habitat for pollinators. And uh, like we're, we don't have much of this habitat, but again, it's, it's where you have this glacial subsoil or, you know, that has been exposed and it's developing this, ha this habitat. So what are we targeting uh, when we, we talk about the Peatland Climate Action Scheme and, and you know, you know what, what are we looking for? Well, it's, it's going to be habitat like this. Again, in a wetland context, we, I talk about emergent um, vegetation and the creation of soggy conditions. So again, like this, this, is, this is fan vegetation. It's, uh, it's still going to be a carbon source, but it's going to be a reduced carbon source. And like, you know, in relation to PCAS, we want to try to minimize development of deeper water where possible through hydrological management. We also want to try to minimize the development of dry birch woodland. Like in this sort of environment, you will get wet woodland development. And again, that's going to be very positive for biodiversity as well. Uh, but we can't expect this habitat to be peat forming uh, in the short term. It is going to take some time for it to kind of switch from being a fan uh, to, you know, starting to develop a bit of peat and then, uh, you know, um, switch to peat forming conditions where it's actually a carbon sink. What's really exciting then is, you know, what we can potentially do on sites where we have deeper peat. And again, like I would have tramped across these bogs uh, and, and looked at a lot of them and you came across pockets of this habitat where deeper peat rewetted naturally. Uh, and again, like this, this didn't reflect any real uh, rehabilitation. It was just that the, the drains had blocked. And you get these basins on deep peats where the water level rose to the surface of the peat, and you've got this fantastic carpet of sphagnum developing naturally. This is all natural colonization. So again, like we know, again, if you can get the hydrology right, you can recreate these conditions. And this is what we're, we're, what we're going to be looking to do on some of our deeper peat bogs. So again, con con creation of soggy conditions, you know, somewhere like it's obviously a wetland, somewhere that you'll have to walk across in your, in your welly boots, but hopefully you wouldn't have to fill your welly boots, you know, in terms of water levels. And again, like we know from the, the work we've done with um, greenhouse gas fluxes, you know, this is analogous to a carbon sink, um, particularly for um, carbon dioxide, okay? Uh, when you put in some of the other factors like methane or DOC, it gets a bit more um, complicated. But anyway, like just to you know show some of the um, some of the sites that we've done in the past. Um, this is Longford Pass, and again, just to show how these sites do change. Like you can be driving a past them for a number of years, and they kind of look like they're they're standing still, but they do change. Uh, this site now, if you're heading down on the motorway to Cork, you've got about five seconds, you know, to look over, uh, out the window uh, as, you're, as you're passing on the motorway just to see this site. Um, but again, that's the way it looked like in 2000, obviously, Burr Peat. Uh, we started to rehabilitate it in 2018. Uh, you can see the kind of structure of, of where we blocked lots of drains. And uh, like you can see that um, that like gray, which is surface water. So the work that we did was very effective in, in terms of rewetting this bog. And that's what it looks like again in um, 2019. 
and again, you know, this is what we, this is, this really reflects the, the approach we took, you know, before the development of PCAS. And again, it was very much about blocking drains, raising water levels. But you can see, obviously, here, we've got um, certain areas where there is uh, more water than we would like, okay, in terms of, you know, what we would call deeper water. And that could be, you know, half a meter, okay, so it's like still not, not a whole pile of water. And the, you know, this is what it actually looks like. Again, once you block the drains, uh, again, you know, you get this kind of dash of water, you know, spreading across uh, the peat fields. In the hollows, obviously, the water will be, uh, you know, filling the hollows. Uh, but then, because our topo the topography of these peat fields and, and different fields at different levels can be so heterogeneous, obviously, we can see some areas are dry, some areas are wet. And in time, then we get natural colonization and the vegetation um, developing in these areas. So again, a few more pictures just to reflect some other sites, uh, you know, where there has been, you know, a lot more natural colonization, you know, uh, after, uh, you know, re-wetting uh, had occurred. Uh, the picture on the bottom, uh, Again, the bottom left, that's Lollymoor. Uh, again, the whiteness is is just the ball cotton that's come out. And what's interesting here is this is a site where uh, it was like this area, this section of Lollymoor was relatively dry. And we have raised the water, and obviously it was relatively dry, birch spread. Uh, now we've raised the water levels, and now some of the trees are starting to die off. And again, just reflect that change of environmental conditions. So again, you know, you can see lots of bog cotton here. Uh, you know, you can see some colonization of reeds and birch and so on. Again, you're not really seeing uh, embryonic raised bog, okay? And that's because of this, this environment that we're working with. So obviously, you know, when, you know, when we start to talk about PCAS and talk about, you know, can, you know, can we be more ambitious here? You know, we start to look further afield at, you know, what had been done in the UK, you know, what had been done in Northern Ireland. And uh, again, in some of their sites, they, they use this kind of unbonding technique. And again, it's about creating these um, small cells. So it's very much trying to look at the site, uh, you know, and look at, you know, put this kind of modular, Imp, um, effect on it in terms of looking at each area uh, individually, uh, looking at the topography of that area and trying to manage the water levels. So again, it's all about water levels close to the peat surface, you know, quite shallow water, even though you can see that, you know, there is surface water here, you, sh you know, like it shouldn't be too deep. And you can see the emerging veg vegetation coming out of it. And, you know, we know that in this environment, the sphagnum will recolonize in time and, and uh, that there has been some fantastic results at all the sites. So we started to take this approach and apply it to some of our bogs. This is Edra bog. Uh, this is uh, close to uh, um, the, the eastern shore of Loch Ree. And you can see that uh, the bear peat, uh, it's quite light in color. You know, we would call this red peat or sphagnum peat. And this is a, you know, a, a real indicator that it's a deep peat bog. And this bog has, you know, some areas where, you know, peat depths would be, you know, two meter, uh, or sorry, four, five meters. But once you look at the topography, uh, once you do hydrologic analysis, you find that uh, this hydrologic analysis, it really looks at um, where the basins are. And obviously if you block the drains, the basins re will re-wet. So looking at the topography as it is now, if we only block the drains, that's all the footprint of the re-wetting, okay? So it means that there's a lot of the bog that will be easier to re-wet, but a lot of the bog won't re-wet at all, you know? And then it will just, it will, it will, uh, you know, it will colonize with trees, it will colonize with heather, and it won't, you know, it won't head down that trajectory that we want in terms of a wetter peatland ecosystem rather than a drier peatland ecosystem. That's not what we want in relation to climate action. So in terms of some, some of the other things that we're starting to look at, you know, we're looking at drainage analysis in a lot more detail. We're looking at flow paths. Uh, and you know, looking to see how the water will flow off these sites, and again, it just you know, it really uh, reflects uh, the topography and obviously the drainage that Bordemona um, did in the past, 
And now we want to look to see, you know, can we, how do we modify this to make the best, uh, you know, to try to spread that, you know, or slow the water flows and spread the water that is, you know, in the site ac across as much of the site as possible. Uh, we're looking at things like slope analysis. You know, this is a, you know, really, you know, you know, complex map. It doesn't really, you know, tell me that much. But, you know, what it does tell me is those yellow areas, you know, which are quite flat, they don't really need that much work. You know, a little bit of drain blocking, and they should re rewet um, quite easily. But it's the mauve areas and the blue areas that have steep slopes that will need a bit more work. So this is the approach that we've been taking, like it's very much a modular approach. It's, it's really looking to, you know, can we modify the topography in, like, you know, in modules and create these kind of flatter surfaces where we can control uh, the water levels better and, and put in these bonds. So we're looking at, a very, you know, obviously a topography that is quite variable. Uh, but here we're trying to, you know, try, can we introduce more flat areas uh, and then can we put in these Bonds so that we get this almost like a paddy field effect where in a heterogeneous topography, water will flow from one section to the next section to the next section to the next section, but it will be at a, a level that we, that we prefer. Again, you know, with a lot of the, our peat fields, uh, they were designed, obviously, um, they were designed to be convex so that the water would flow off. And obviously, this enabled peat extraction, you know, because we used the sun to dry out the peat. But we're starting to look at, you know, can we reverse that? Can we, instead of uh, having a convex um, peat field, can we create a dish that will hold the water and, you know, push peat from the middle of the peat field out to the edge? and uh, create, you know, a flatter surface or, or you know, concave surface that will actually hold that water better and hold a little bit of surface water. Other things we're doing in relation to, uh, people, you know, climate action scheme, we're like we're really looking at hydrology in a lot more detail. We're looking at um, how our bogs interact with surrounding lands because, you know, a key key issue for you know when we started to talk to stakeholders was you know how you know what's the, you know the neighbors to our, our sites wanted to know what's going to happen to my land and we had to assure them that anything we did wasn't going to create a flood risk to their lands and and so that means pragmatic compromises that means that you know that there will be drains along our margins that we won't block because we don't want to impact on adjacent land but we are carrying out drainage management plans and this has been carried out by RPS, you know, independent um, hydrological consultants. This is what some of the work looks like on the ground, you know, like it is rough and ready, you know, we're using um, bulldozers to level out some of these peat fields. Uh, this machine on the, on the left hand side at the bottom left, this is a screw leveler. We would, would have used that to um, you know, clear off vegetation and, and design the peat fields, but now if we uh, it's called reverse screw leveling. It actually works the opposite way to now to reprofile some of these peat fields. And, you know, on a wider scale, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is Casagar. This is, you know, one of the bogs where we started to try these, um, some of these methods um, last year. Again, you can see the, the bonding uh, that has been put in place, uh, the modular approach. You can see um, drain blocking. Uh, as well. So what we did here at this site, we, we tried a couple of different um, methods and, and you can see um, both of these methods and what you can really compare and contrast, you can see the area that uh, you know, has been um, rehabilitated and you can compare that to the adjacent area where the, the drainage is, is still functional and again still quite dry. And again, I think the, the, the ultimate challenge for us uh, in terms of planning this rehabilitation is really trying to um, spread that water out, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, doing a better job of trying to optimize the hydrology, because if we do that, we know we're going to get better results in terms of biodiversity, and then in climate action, um, and so on and so forth. Again, just another, another uh, view. And again, look, I'm really heartened to see some of these results. This, these pictures were taken in May, just after the last winter, and, you know, showing that you know, the bog, the peat has been rewetted. And this is obviously the first step. And again, 
you know, we're going to, you know, depend on natural colonization to bring the plants in. And we will also look to see, can we seed some plants into uh, these um, areas, you know, seeds and um, some things like sphagnum. But, you know, when you're dealing with 33,000 hectares, uh, to seed it all, you would need a lot of seed. So, you know, that's one of the constraints that we're dealing with. Again, just to look at another area, uh, this is Omeris Bog in, uh, near Monster Evan. Again, you can see, uh, you know, some of the machines out in, in on the bog there. Uh, and again, you can see, uh, this was, you know, taken um, just, you know, quite recently. So, uh, like it's, obviously, you know, just reflecting the, dr the, the dry summer that we've had. And again, you know, taking this modular, modular approach, the bog in no way is flat. So again, we're, we're probably going from higher ground in the foreground to low ground in the distance. And, and that's where the water will eventually flow. And by putting in all these bonds, what we're doing is we're slowing that water flow. And, you know, we're trying, you know, that will allow, uh, the best use of of you know water that, you know that comes under our site you know but it's not getting away uh, and straight away and then it's going to rewet that peat and encourage uh, the development of of of, of wet uh, peat and ecosystems. Uh, this is us uh, out yesterday. Uh, this is the ecology team, uh, and again, if I was given this talk um, two years ago like it would have been me and half of me, you know, uh, you know, we were uh, down to one and a half in, in 2019. And th th this just really reflects the change in board Nimona. And, uh, you know, now we're, we're a team of, of six. Uh, and again, like we've had to grow because the regulatory bar has also grown. Our rehabilitation plans that previously would have been 20 pages are now 80 pages. You know, we're you know we're looking at things in a lot more detail now, and obviously this needs a lot more time and, and a lot more expertise. And so again, look really heartening to see uh, you know the expansion of the team and you know just a reflection of the new direction we're going in now. Uh, my my department in Board of Mona is called Land and Habitats, you know, and I would describe that as ecology coming in and taking over the energy team. And now, like our our whole focus now is delivering um, professional peatland services into the future. And, you know, again, if we can make a success of this, you know, it's going to have a huge impact on, on a lot of Irish peatlands. So again, just um, uh, uh, some more views of, of the peatlands uh, at, at Pullabog, you know, the site that we were visiting yesterday. And again, you can see the, the cells here, again, the modular approach. What's really interesting here is um, they, they have a spring. Uh, the spring has been pumping water uh, all, all summer. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, one of the team leaders yesterday. He suggested that we shouldn't be doing this at all. We should be trying to bottle the water and, and, and actually uh, develop and pull a spring water. Uh, but again, uh, if you've got springs on site, you know, you've, you know, that are going to continue to keep that water or that site wet during the summer. That's a real um, advantage in terms of, uh, you know, trying to re-wet peat. And again, just to demonstrate, uh, you know, these sites, as I say, like peat and rehabilitation does take time. And I, I know like sometimes they look as if they're standing still, but if you look at, look at the, the great aerial photography series now that we, that we have now from um, 2000, you can really see them changing. This is a site in 2000, mostly bare peat. Again, 2005, you can see the Northern side is, is now um, colonized north of the railway. Again, 2015, a lot more vegetation to the south of the railway. Peat, extra, um, peat extraction has now stopped. And then 2020, again, uh, we did some work here, rehabilitation in 2018, carried out some re um, rewetting. And now the majority of the site is uh, revegetated. And for me, like a simple key, you know, measure of success is seeing this change from, you know, mostly bare peat to mostly vegetation. And then obviously these are pioneer habitats, they will change, okay, and they will develop wetland habitats. So we're going to do a lot of monitoring verification, obviously, you know, with all this work, we want to, you know, see, you know, you know can we verify uh, the benefits, particularly in relation to 
um, carbon fluxes, water levels, water quality, water attenuation, and then in relation to biodiversity, you know, it, um, impacts on, on breeding birds, for example, or, or development of um, new habitats. So there's a lot of science uh, that we want to really um, get um, rolling here in relation to the whole monitoring and verification. Just this, and again, there's, there's huge amounts in relation to research uh, that you could uh, um, look at as well, you know, in, ter in terms of what we're doing. Um, so the PCAS, it, it will fund um, two PhDs projects and, and one postdoc, but there will be additional uh, research ongoing with all the other peatland projects that are ongoing. And just to talk about some of um, climate action and, you know, um, carbon fluxes uh, in terms of the work that we've done in the past. I don't want any, like we know that uh, Alvin County Mayo, uh, uh, re-wetted cutaway, like this became a, like a sink for carbon dioxide like within 10 years and that's because it was sphagnum rich and sure it was sphagnum rich because it was wet out there, uh, it had underlying um, acidic geology which really pr um, promoted the sphagnum growth. Appenway Arwood, uh, again you know the work that you know Florence Renew and David Wilson did out there, again this is a, this is a restored bog and eight years after that restoration was carried out, it was again a sink for uh, greenhouse gases. So, but obviously a sink for um, CO2, but a slight source for methane. And again, this is where um, carbon fluxes get complicated. Uh, and again, like the DOC or the, the carbon that would be leaving the site through the water hasn't been accounted for yet. And then at Blackwater, uh, this is a cutaway site. Uh, uh, David Wilson did some work in a, a reed bed um, habitat. Uh, he found that was one year it was a sink for carbon, the next year it was a source. And you know it's almost counterintuitive, but the year it was a sink was a really dry year. Uh, the dryness uh, encouraged um, the growth of the reeds. There was more biomass, so it sucked in more carbon. So that's almost counterintuitive to us as, as restoration ecologists that want to keep things wet. Um, but we know that, you know, in this sort of um, scenario, the best outcome is for, uh, uh, you know, some of these fan sites or wetland sites to go from a higher carbon source to a reduced carbon source. And then in time, hopefully um, stabilize them to, you know, as, uh, you know, as uh, we develop these um, peatland habitats again. Obviously, we have a huge amount of biodiversity across our sites, uh, which is really um, pleasing to see. Uh, some of our cutaways, as soon as they're re-wetted, are really good for um, breeding waders, um, like lapwing. Uh, they attract species that you wouldn't expect to be on peatland sites, like bee orchid. And again, this just reflects, you know, some, some sites are uh, have this calcareous subsoil, this glacial subsoil that's exposed now, and they're almost like eskers, and they can be really um, fantastic for biodiversity. And we see just orchids continue to spread and, and spread across the cutaway. They can be really good for um, wetland birds, uh, particularly wintering and um, whooper swans. Some of our sites uh, across the Midlands, uh, you know, along the Suck and the Shannon, they attracted, you know, huge numbers of whooper swans uh, that, you know, were equivalent to some of the highest numbers of the national counts in, you know, 2010 and in 2015. Uh, and these are internationally important. And then what was really exciting, uh, just, uh, you know, in the last year or two, uh, the appearance of the giant our, um, crane. And again, this is a species that hasn't been breeding <coughs> Um, 300 years, uh, but sure didn't uh, we find a per one of our bogs and I'm sure they were they were breeding with uh, you know once they left we, we found a nest uh, and when we actually had a look we actually found there were two nests so probably indicating that they were there for uh, more than one year and they came back again this year and you know this is really exciting and just an indication of you know if you develop these, these um, wetland habitats, you know, in terms of unintended consequences, we will, we will see, you know, species like these um, cranes colonized. 
so all, all this work, you know, like it's, you know, okay, you get out on site and okay, like maybe in a day you build 20 peat dams and okay, you do a hectare, but then the next day you do another hectare, and the next day you do another hectare. This is really significant at, an, at a national scale and all this work will feed into all these different sectoral plans. For example, the Climate Action Plan, the National Biodiversity um, Action Plan, the River Basin Management Plan in terms of water quality, National Peatland Strategy in terms of um, raised bog restoration, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So like, this is really important for uh, uh, the Irish government, particularly in relation to how it manages peatlands and uh, you know, peatland land use. So just to summarize, uh, key messages for us, uh, we're targeting 33,000 hectares. Uh, weather means more carbon trapped in the gown. Uh, there will be different outcomes. Again, some of these habitats, uh, they're going to be reed swamp fan. You know, they're not going to be raised bogs anytime soon. It takes time to develop these um, um, habitats again. Uh, but we really want to put that skin back on, on our bird peat, uh, that skin of vegetation, and we want that skin to be soggy. So again, in terms of, you know, just wetter, soggy conditions. So just, just to uh, say a little bit about um, bog restoration as opposed to rehabilitation. Uh, obviously, we, have, uh, we had some bogs. Uh, we drained them, but we didn't um, develop them. They were put on the long finger for industrial peat extraction. I'm sure we thought we would need them um, down the road in the future. But then we realized, look, we, we weren't really going to um, utilize them. So we started to carry a bog restoration in 2009. And um, like this is an ongoing project, and it's very important for uh, you know for Ireland, you know, particularly in relation to meeting EU habitat directive commitments, because some of these sites are now going to replace other de more degraded raised bogs that are you know going to fall off the the list for conservation sites because of all, you know the wider issues of turf cutting and, and so on. So just to show you. Uh, the extent of some of these sites. Again, we started off in Abbey Leaks Bog in 2009. Uh, this has been a really successful project in terms of the rewetting. It's 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 gone from I think half a hectare of active raised bog to now nearly 13 hectares. It's you know it's managed now by a local community. So we have you know in terms of border mona sites, we have more than uh, and 25 sites now. Uh, we have done a total of of 3, 000, over 3,000 hectares. And this is this is growing. Again, just to show you uh, just the distribution of some of these sites. Again, the methodology. Anyone who's been involved in peatland restoration, you know, be familiar with this. The creation of peat dams. Uh, we find uh, find these very successful, very successful in terms of um, bringing um, water levels to the the bog surface. So again, just. The whole approach is blocking drains to raise the water levels. We want to re-wet the peat and encourage the natural development of the sphagnum rich plant um, communities that are already there. And like the okay, the sphagnum like it will take time to respond, but after 10 years, like you will get patches of sphagnum rich habitat back in these bogs again. Again, just in terms of monitoring, you know, some of the monitoring we did at one of these sites, you can compare some of the quadrats in 2012, 2017. And again, you know, sphagnum is increasing, sphagnum cover. Again, you can then look at pictures, look at how they're, how they're doing. I think the pictures at the bottom are, are really good. You know, 2011 compared to 2017, this is what we know as a borrow pit, where we took the peat to build the peat dam. But you can see it's, you know, it's, it's starting to colonize. It has sphagnum in it in 2017. So improving in condition all the time. This is really exciting for me. This is Kelly's Grove bog. This is a bog we were working on this summer. Uh, I don't know if you can count them, but there's actually five diggers on this bog. And, and that's a real reflection of where we've come from. In 2015, the ecology team, it was looking after one digger, okay? Uh, one digger putting in about 25 peat dams uh, a day. Uh, that grew to three diggers in 2018. And now, in relation to the PCAS, we've got this summer, uh, you know, roughly 100 machines carrying out peatland restoration and rehabilitation works. So a real 
like one real indicator of the new ambition for Borden and Mona and uh, you know the uh, the a real indicator of the scale of the work that we're doing. Uh, so again, you can see like over the summer, you can see already the, the bog starting to re-wet there. And again, like this is a relatively flat bog. Uh, we anticipate potentially between 25 and 40 hectares of active raised bog developing on this site again. And again, this was a bog that was drained, but never developed. So it still had the original veg bog vegetation on the surface, but it was degraded. Just a few more pics again. Uh, this is Mostrum bog. Uh, you can see the, the bog remnant um, um, to the north or, or uh, in the distance. Um, so again, there, there was always these areas where we didn't manage to get into uh, through various different reasons. And I'm sure, look, that was great in relation to ecology because it meant we had the intact habitat. And again, just to point out, uh, as I said before, the, the, you know, in terms of our raised bog um, um, restoration program, the work that um, EPA funded, um, that you know, Florence Renew Wilson carried out, you know, find, you know, indicating that these bogs do become a sink uh, very quickly for um, carbon dioxide. But obviously the, the whole fluxes can be quite complicated in relation to methane and then in relation to DOC. So if you're looking for more information on the Peatland Climate Action Scheme, do have a look at our website, BNM PCAS. Uh, we do have uh, more material there. We now have a community liaison officer if anyone is interested, if anyone is close to our box and wants to hear more about what we're doing. And, uh, you know, just to finish, like, obviously, I'm talking a lot, very much focused on rehabilitation and restoration, but for Board Namona as a company, like, we are, we've moved away from fossil fuels, uh, we've done that kind of about turn, and now we're looking to the future in terms of renewable energy and climate action, and uh, developing, re, uh, you know, renewable energy like wind farms on our bogs, and this is, this is uh, Mount Lucas Wind Farm. And uh, that's going to be the direction um, down the road, trying to integrate these land uses. And uh, obviously, like we know that that, that comes with trade-offs, but you can see from this photograph that, you know, just because you put a, a wind farm in these sites, it doesn't mean that you can't have re-wetting as well. And for me, uh, as an ecologist, you know, I'll be looking for, you know, in terms of developing these um, projects, you know, developing these kind of win-win scenarios where, we're, you know, we're doing the best we can for biodiversity. We're doing the best we can for peatland rehabilitation on these sites. And it's not just about um, renewable energy. Anybody who's been down to the Midlands, uh, you know, has visited Lockport Discovery Park. It's a fantastic resource. Uh, it's just used more by more and more people. And this sort of land use blends very well with peatland rewetting. Uh, you don't need much infrastructure for tracks and so on. You can keep the tracks to, you know, the high ground. It's going to be dry anyway. And sure, you know, it, you know, it means that, you know, the local communities can get out into these landscapes and enjoy them. Just a few more pictures of uh, Lockboard Discovery Park. Again, you know, I would urge any of you who haven't visited to, you know, make a point of, of getting down and visiting it at, at some stage. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, we do have a few questions that were asked there um, during your talk. So um, I don't know whether you can see them or whether you'd like me to read them out. Um, perhaps I'll read them and then you can answer the questions or, or make a comment if, if, if they, if they um, if you've got a comment to make. So Jamie Rowe, who says 33,000 um, hectares will be enhanced rehabilita rehabilitated. How much of the remaining 47,000 hectares of land is ear earmarked for wind farms? And what will happen with the other land? What <laughs> progress has there been on alternative projects like herbs, fish farming and birch water? Okay, well, how are you, Jamie? Um, lots to get in, uh, into there. Um, we would generally say that uh, Board and Mona have rehabilitated 20,000 hectares already. Okay, so if you think about our, 
or, or land bank of 80,000 hectares, okay? And sure, Jamie, some of that land is, is in Littleton that you, you would have visited um, several times. Um, so the 33,000 hectares, you know, that's really looking at, you know, land that has come out of mostly out of peat production uh, just in, in uh, recently. Uh, but that's not to say that, like, we will be looking at, you know, some of the lands that we had rehabilitated in the past, like, for example, Derry Brat that I, 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 I showed you, and look to see, you know, can we do more on those sites? Um, in relation to wind farms, uh, I think we have four wind farms that are constructed at the moment in operation. Uh, we have uh, six wind farm um, or solar energy projects, mostly wind farms that are either in const construction or in the planning phases. And like there would be an, an ambition to do more, okay, in relation to develop more sites. So, but of the scale of, you know, I think it's, of, you know, between five and 10 projects. So hard to put a number on it in terms of, you know, what the actual footprint is going to be because, you know, that obviously, ref you know, uh, reflects, uh, you know, planning issues, uh, reflects hard constraints like where you can actually put these um, renewable energy projects. Um, but, you know, for me, the, the future landscape, it will be a landscape of, of sites like Mount Lucas, where you have integrated land uses, uh, you have the wind farm infrastructure, you know, which is only about 4% of the overall footprint of those sites with a lot, um, you know, all, all that cutaway um, um, habitats developing in between. Uh, and then you'll have other sites that, you know, you know, would be left for biodiversity. Biodiversity would be in the main land use and there may be amenity associated with that as well. In relation to other future land uses, we're not really looking at forestry uh, down the road. You know, we've planted, you know, um, four and a half thousand hectares of forestry, conifer forestry on our lands. And a lot of it is, you know, it, it's poor, it, it's not really productive. Uh, farm farmland. We're not really looking to convert these um, cutaway peatlands into farmland anymore. Sure, we know the impacts in relation to you know um, um, carbon now, uh, but that has had uh, in in relation to the wider landscape. And then in relation to some of the other projects uh, that we were uh, um, looking at, for example, growing herbs. Uh, you know, we did have a project over the past few years um, growing pharmaceuticals. And, uh, you know, that was relatively successful uh, in relation to dealing with some of the technical aspects. They were able to grow um, herbs, uh, you know, and the, some of these herbs were things like dandelion or, or mint, you know, things that you wouldn't think you could uh, actually get a market for. But there's, there's a huge market for, for some of these plants. Um, water horse steel, for example, or, or marsh horse steel, Echocetum and Palustre. Uh, who knew? Um, but Board and Mona, they aren't going to uh, continue on with that project. And again, that just reflects the, you know, the commerciality and the real challenges of making some of these projects um, commercially feasible. And uh, for me, you know, it's, it's a pity. It's disappointing. You know, there's lots of things that you, uh, you could do, you know, and I'm sure people have talked about sphagnum farming as well. Um, but again, at at so, uh, at a certain level, uh, somebody has to sign off on relation to the costs of that, and at the moment, uh, we're very much focused on renewable energy. Grand. And Jamie's also asked: Will cutaway high fields and headlands be rewetted um, under the PCAS? Well, you know. Uh, logically, high fields and headlands will be high. So, uh, in general, they won't develop wet habitats. Mm -hmm. Okay, they'll probably develop drier habitats like um, birch woodland or uh, uh, you know dry heather um, habitats. And again, that just reflects uh, the constraints that we work with. A uh, headland is is close to the edge of the bog. Uh, we, we tend to be constrained in terms of blocking the mar marginal drains. So that headland, that higher ground, it's always going to be dry. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a, a simply, simply answered question from Emily. What was the name of the precedent project in the UK, please? She asks. She couldn't catch that. Oh, uh, there was, um, I have pictures from the UK from Bolton Fell. 
and so there's another project in Wales. Uh, oh, it's a, it, it was from the the Life Project, the recent Life Project in Wales on on okay. Beatles, um, So I'm sure you'll be able to check from uh, Google that to, to make sure. Um, and there's a comment from Jackie, a question from Jackie. Mark, what's your opinion on the proposed National Peatland Park plan? So, the, you know, that park, um, that park plan, it's, it's very much a proposal for Board Mona lands in, in, you know, in County Kildare, in like the eastern part of our land bank. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, several people have put together, and several organisations put together a proposal. You know, to, you know, in relation to, you know, why don't we develop this vast area, formerly the Bog of Allen, into a national peatlands park? So a lot of it is, uh, you know, it's it's bur peat at the moment. It was in peat production until not too recently, and uh, you know, this is a, actually, you know, like it's a fantastic vision. Um, but Board and Mona, uh, they're looking at other um, land uses, other aspects, and like we have, we are planning, uh, you know, an uh, industrial wind farm for a lot of that area. So again, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, can we combine different land uses here? You know, can you know, can we have a park with uh, wind turbines in it? You know, is that you know, is that something that we can live with uh, in terms of um, land uses uh, and in terms of you know, enjoy the enjoying you know biodiversity, enjoying biodiversity, or enjoying outdoors. And again, it comes back to the challenges that we face in relation to uh, you know meeting these climate action targets. Uh, the government very much want Board Mona to um, deliver on renewable energy, and. Uh, and it get, but again, it comes back to that challenge of wh well, where do you put this? And uh, like while we have 80,000 hectares, uh, that land bank starts to um, shrink significantly when, uh, you know, when there's, you know, lots of bogs where you decide, well, actually, uh, we won't develop that uh, because, uh, you know, we, we'd like to do um, something else on it, you know? So, uh, that just, you know, that really reflects uh, the challenges in relation to the land use that we have in front of us. Okay, that's good. Now I've got a wee question from somebody, a uh, group that couldn't attend today, um, the Mid Shannon Wilderness Park. Um, and they asked on Twitter, they said, um, could, could I ask why um, being board and owner, um, see it as acceptable to continue extensive pumping of water off bogs directly leading to habitat loss and continued carbon release. So I wonder if you could just comment about, you know, still draining some bogs. Yeah, well, look, we, we still have, are running some pumps, uh, particularly on, on those pump bogs, uh, you know, along, you know, County Longford, Roscombe and so on. And that's because, uh, like, to turn the pump off, we really want to do that in a, in a managed way. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that we don't have these unintended consequences of impacting on neighbouring land. And, you know, that's one reason. And the other reason is uh, for some of our lands, uh, you know, some of these lands are being uh, considered for renewable energy. And, you know, until that decision is made in relation to renewable energy development or, you know, that project has gone through planning or in construction, we would uh, maintain pumping. But what I would say is, you know, in the past we would would have we would have pumped to obviously remove surface water to enable peat extraction, but now we don't have to do that. So for me, uh, on those sites where there is continued pumping, I would be looking to reduce the level of pumping so that again we get this win-win scenario of soggy conditions. Uh, uh, you know, and keeping those um, sites wet so that we have a, like that win-win for, for climate action. But obviously, you know, meaning that the wind farm infrastructure isn't going to be inundated by uh, um, too much water. Okay, that's great. So that comes to the end of the written questions. If anyone has any questions that you'd like to direct to Mark, you know, um, yourself now, just turn off your um, microphone and speak up and we'll see if there are any questions. Everyone's going to be very quiet. I'll maybe just jump in there, ask a quick question to Mark, just to clarify a point. If that's okay. 
Yeah, Barha Thanks, Jamie. Mark, for a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Um, the, you mentioned just very briefly, you've 20,000 hectares uh, rehabilitated, so that's a standard rehabilitation. And then this 33 is the enhanced, the PCAS. So altogether, you've got 53,000 hectares rehabilitated. Correct, but Jamie, now this is like doing sets with my daughter. Um, you know, um, so some of this, some of these um, sets are, are going to be overlapping. Okay, so uh, so then if you if you throw in some of the other areas, Jamie, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know that doesn't you know include say the the area over in uh, or you know the Confort Plantation. <coughs> you know, that we've developed on our cutaway or, uh, or, or some of the um, renewable energy projects that we've already developed, you know. Yeah, so, so that 20,000 could include Mount Lucas, for example? Um, it, it includes a portion of Mount Lucas, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, it, you know, and it, this, this can be a real challenge for us in terms of how you slice and dice our land bank and, and then what categories you put on it, you know. And take, for example, Mount Lucas. Um, how do you categorize that site? Uh, is the whole site an industrial site or is it just the, the wind farm infrastructure? Is the industrial part and the remaining is, is cut away, you know? And, and so when you, when you start doing your accountants, accountancy in terms of uh, um, habitats and so on, that can be a, just a challenge. And just one more point um, you mentioned as well, Littleton, there's no more work going on down there. It's done. There's no more, there's no enhanced rehabilitation or any more rehabilitation done there since I was done there last, last year? Uh, no work uh, done there since you were done last year, Jamie. Uh, no work plans. There is still some work left to do uh, that's on the long finger that I, I want to get down and finish out. And uh, we will look, be looking at, you know, to see, to really review those sites, to see, you know, can, you know is there more that we can do, you know, because uh, what's really interesting is, uh, you bring a range of different people out uh, to our bogs and, uh, uh, you know, and you get a, like a range of obviously different opinions and, you know, lots of people, you know, think that you, we, we should be doing a lot more with our bogs in terms of our cutaways, but obviously there's a cost to that. And uh, it's, you know, and this is a key thing for the Peat and Climate Action Scheme. If we think about the simplest things that we can do, in relation to climate action, the first one was to stop peat extraction. The second one is to, you know, block peat dams. Uh, but again, like the, the law of diminishing returns applies here. So as you do more and more actions like bonding or uh, reconture and so on, uh, the, ben the, the cost of those actions goes up and probably the overall benefits are, are diminishing, you know. So for me, the challenge in relation to all of this is really, you know, we, we, we want to continue to innovate. We want to take a flexible approach. Uh, we want to, you know, keep it adaptive, you know, keep learning and, uh, you know, to try, keep trying to make it more effective and more efficient. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. So any other questions out there? Um, if not, we will uh, we'll draw this morning's session to a close. No. I think you've answered loads of questions and Mark, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting, um, um, has cleared up a lot of points that I had questions about and um, I really look forward to you finding out um, and learning new techniques and developing them so that other people can apply them to other places as well. Um, it's an opportunity. Um, it may not have, have per be perfect in everybody's eyes, but um, it's certainly better than digging the peat out. So thanks very much um, and thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending this morning. Um, okay, well, look, um, thank, thanks, Abby. And look, I just say, you know, uh, with all of this, uh, like, you know, sometimes there are no right answers. And like you learn sometimes more by making the mistakes than, than you do by uh, the successes. So uh, I look, anybody who's working in this field, you know, just continue on, you know, continue on um, working. You know, it's it's really really exciting at the moment uh it's really important and uh you know it has to be done and 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 we just need to get stuck in and 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 get these get these bogs rewarded
And I certainly think you need more people in your team. <laughs> Such a huge yeah. land holding. <laughs> so hopefully they will, we'll add a few more ecologists in um, to get a little bit more of the science work behind it sorted as well. So anyway, thank you very much everyone for attending and um, we will end this session now and um, I'm sure we'll have more um, talks over the next year. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.